it's Claire, welcome back. I hope you've all been doing well. It's been a while for no particular reason other than just life stuff and general inertia. But now that Rick has returned to booktube, I thought I would hop on and see if anyone is still hanging around these parts. And for those of you who still are, to talk about some of the best books that I've read between July 2022 and now. I have found during this unplanned year-long plus break from booktube that my reading has become more aimless and haphazard than ever. It's been mood reading in the extreme Extreme. And on the one hand, it has been extremely freeing and liberating to read without thinking about what I want to say about what I'm reading, without worrying about how fast I'm reading, or whether I'm reading anything any given month at all. I've read several books for one-off book clubs with friends that I otherwise wouldn't have picked up. And in one instance, I read a very hefty bucket list classic without worrying about how long it was going to take me or whether or not it was detracting from the rest of my reading life. Giving into that flexibility and inertia in my reading life has been really wonderful in a lot of ways, but I have also gotten out of the habit of thinking deeply and critically about what I'm reading. And I do think that my reading life has been less rich and less rewarding because of that. I've read far more forgettable books in the last year, and not because the books themselves are inherently less memorable, more because after I've put them down, I have simply not spent any time thinking about them. And in instances where I have started to think about a book, either in a book club discussion with friends or in many an abandoned Google Doc with a sort of half-written book review in it, I've found that I've often abandoned those trains of thoughts before I've really cracked what I'm trying to understand or grasp about a book, which is something that I have missed about booktube and have been wanting to get back to. I think there have also been points in the past few years where I have felt burned out on booktube or motivated by the wrong things. And now having had some time away, I feel like I have finally circled back to the reasons that I started posting on booktube in the first place, which is to talk about the books that I'm reading, to think about the books that I'm reading more deeply, and to just live a little bit longer with those books after I've finished reading them. So with all of that said, I just wanted to hop back on here and say hi, and also talk about some of my favorite books and favorite reading experiences from my 16 months or so away from booktube. First up, I have Stay True by Hua Su, which I actually think I want to do a full review on, so I'm going to try and keep my thoughts here brief. But Hua Su is a staff writer for The New Yorker, and this book won the 2023 Pulitzer Prize for Memoir. It is in part about Hua Su's experiences growing up in the late 80s and 90s Bay Area as the son of Taiwanese immigrants, but it's mostly about his college years at UC Berkeley in the 1990s and his unlikely friendship with Ken Ishida, a popular, handsome, Abercrombie-clad frat bro who is as mainstream and affable as Hua is alternative and aloof. For three years, they bond over mixtapes and cigarettes and late night drives, winding conversations about girls and TV and their burgeoning theories of Asian American identity. But the summer between their junior and senior years, Ken is killed senselessly and violently in a carjacking. And so Stay True is not just a book about male friendship and music and California in the 90s. It's also a book about youth and loss and world ending grief and about the meaning that may or may not be found in old photographs and archives, in writing and memory and the stories we tell ourselves. I found Stay True to be a profoundly moving book and one that haunted me for a long time after I finished reading it. It is one of the best, most resonant depictions of college friendship that I have ever read, and it offers an incisive consideration of the uncertainties and the unknowability and the kind of unsteadiness that can exist within friendships more so than in other kinds of bonds. It also looks at the slipperiness of trying to eulogize or memorialize a person who has passed, particularly a young person who was still a work in progress and full of promise that was never realized. It looks at how trying to capture 
the memory of a person can at times inherently be at odds with the fluidity and amorphousness of life as it is actually lived and experienced. It is such a stunning, remarkable, and gutting book. I truly cannot recommend it enough. Next up, I have Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfeld, which I also loved for very different reasons. I will admit that I approached this novel with some trepidation because Curtis Sittenfeld is an author who is known for writing at the intersection of literary and commercial fiction, and she is notably not a romance writer. And so I was worried that she was going to do that thing where she tries to capitalize on the popularity of the rom-com brand that's happening right now and try to elevate the genre and make it smarter while failing to fulfill any of its promises. Think all those indie movies from the 2010s that called themselves indie romantic comedies or movies about what happens after the happily ever after and kind of position themselves as inherently smarter and better than the rom-coms of the 90s and early aughts. That's what I was afraid this book was going to be, but fear not, I am thrilled to report that romantic comedy is a true blue romance novel that hits all of the beats of the romance genre. We've got a meet cute, we've got banter, we've got a normie dating a celebrity, and on top of that, Curtis Sittenfeld accomplishes what all of those indie rom-coms could not, which is that she captures the experience of falling in love and some of its less glamorous attendant details with a certain degree of grounded realism. But she's able to do that without sacrificing the fizziness and the fantasy and the heightened emotions of the romance genre. This novel follows Sally Mill, a writer at an SNL-esque late night comedy show who writes a sketch called The Danny Horst Rule, where she skewers all of her schlubby male co-workers who end up dating hot actresses or pop stars who guest host the show. Think Pete Davidson and Ariana Grande, Emma Stone and her random SNL writer husband who is not Andrew Garfield. The joke of Sally's sketch is that you would never have that situation with the genders swapped until, of course, Noah Brewster, a global pop singer-songwriter superstar, guest hosts the show and takes an unlikely but immediate shine to Sally. So here we have the beloved gender-swapped Notting Hill trope of a celebrity dating a normal civilian. And it is so sweet and swoony and romantic while also having a real depth to it. Curtis Sittenfeld has so many moments and insights here that are just so smart and feel so true. The book is divided into three sections. The first one follows Noah's week of guest hosting at the show, where he and Sally have an initial flirtation before an argument sends them their separate ways. The second section of the book is a series of emails from the summer of 2020, where Noah and Sally are reconnecting amidst the isolation of the pandemic. And the last section is them finally back together in the same place, trying to suss out whether or not a relationship would actually work. It's a bit of an unnecessarily fussy structure, but I will say I think what really works about it is that in having the kind of initial flirtation encounter in the first section and then the emails unfolding two years later in the second section, what Curtis Sittenfeld gives you is the chance to watch Noah and Sally fall in love twice. So it avoids that narrative sag that you sometimes find in the back half of romance novels, by extending the period of the limerence or the kind of butterflies in your stomach fizziness longer than most books are able to. The other thing I really love about this book is that Sally is set up as this character who is a woman in her late 30s who is really talented and career driven and hardworking, who has a lot of friends and a sense of community, but has been unlucky in love and who has kind of accepted that true love just might not be in the cards for her. And I love how the dreamboat celebrity falling in love with an average looking normie trope almost functions here as a kind of metaphor for just the unlikely miracle that is finding meaningful connection with another person. At one point in his emails, Noah says, aren't we all just looking for someone to talk about everything with? Which sounds like a simple enough thing, but can in fact be incredibly rare and special and may seem for someone like Sally as fantastical and out of reach as 
falling in love with a global pop superstar. So I love the way that Curtis Sittenfeld in this book balances the fantasy of the romance genre with the grounded details of real life in a way that makes this book, I think, a cream of the crop romance novel. Shortly after Romantic Comedy, I also read Prep by Curtis Sittenfeld, which is her debut novel from 2005. It follows Lee Fiora, a middle-class high achiever from South Bend, Indiana, who decides that she wants to go to boarding school on the East Coast and convinces her parents to let her enroll at ALT, a private boarding school in Massachusetts. So this is a classic campus novel. It follows Lee throughout her four years at ALT and it explores, as you might expect, all of the awkwardness and cringiness of being an adolescent, but it also looks specifically at Lee's fish out of water experience attending ALT, trying to navigate East Coast wealth and elite East Coast circles for the first time. Lee is not only from the Midwest, but she's also one of the few scholarship kids at ALT her father is a mattress salesman where some of her classmates are the children of senators. And Lee, like many teenagers, is incredibly impressionable. And her exposure to this rarefied prep school world completely raises her sense of self-worth and her confidence. And some of it is real, but a lot of it is just in her head in a way that is incredibly painful to read about. And the most horrible, painful thing about this novel is that she never recovers, at least not during her time at Alt. And at the same time that Lee is barely keeping her head above water in this world, she is also allowing herself to be fully and completely imbued with its values. And it's almost because Lee is so willing and eager to embrace this alt worldview that she feels herself unworthy of the place itself to the point that she can barely function within it. I found this to be a genuinely excruciating read, like truly almost unbearable, which I say with all credit to Curtis Sittenfeld. And while the book captures campus life and the specificity of a high school ecosystem so well, it has the head boy and girl that everyone loves, the time-honored idiosyncratic school traditions, and that strange intimate familiarity that exists between you and your classmates, even if you're not necessarily friends. It's all so good and so delicious, but at the same time, I found Lee's passivity and her inability to thrive in this East Coast elite academic setting so painful. It reminded me too acutely of going to college on the East Coast myself. And I have to say, whatever it was that Either Or by Elif Bachman healed with regard to my feelings about my university years, prepped by Curtis Sittenfeld, destroyed and undid all of that good work. So hats off to you, Curtis, for that. I also want to mention Tom Lake by Ann Patchett. This is my first Ann Patchett novel, despite having purchased several of her books in the past for the older women in my life. I do think I regarded her books in my own head as kind of older, mom book club fiction. I still kind of think of them that way, fairly or unfairly, but I did really enjoy Tom Lake. I read it in about two days, which for me is very fast, but then I proceeded to completely forget about it. And it's only in doing this video that I am now thinking about it again and remembering all of the kind of warm and cozy and contented feelings that reading that book gave me. This novel is set on a cherry farm in northern Michigan in the spring and early summer of 2020. Another pandemic novel for this wrap up. Lara, our protagonist, is busy harvesting cherries with her husband and her three adult daughters, all of whom have come home to the farm during this period of isolation during the early pandemic. And as they pick cherries, and lay in the grass and eat and make dinner together every night. Lara's daughters implore her to tell the story from an earlier season in her life in her early 20s when she spent a summer doing summer stock playing Emily in Our Town and had a summer romance with Peter Duke who would go on to become one of the most famous and beloved actors of his generation. And I have to say, Tom Lake is really a masterclass in how to take a quiet literary novel and make it commercial. Lara as a character is basically a blank. She's a cipher. She has no personality that I could discern, but surround her with a dreamy Northern Michigan setting in 
in both timelines and give her this hot romance with a future Hollywood star and you're good to go. Ann Patchett also does this thing where she withholds and then parcels out crucial pieces of information as Lara tells her story. So you'll find out that so-and-so from the past storyline is actually so-and-so in the present day storyline. And so she builds in this subtle, cozy sense of mystery into an otherwise pretty straightforward story. She also smartly gives the handsome future Hollywood star an even hotter and more appealing older brother who everyone literally calls Saint Sebastian because that's how good and dreamy and decent he is, which in my opinion is straight out of the YA playbook. So well done Anne for that. I too was in love with Sebastian. And I actually went to a talk with Anne Patchett recently where she said that she almost wrote the book from Sebastian's perspective, which is interesting to think about if you've read the book. I found the ending and elements of it a little bit too tidy and unbelievable. And again, I don't think there's a whole lot here that you need to sit with and meditate on, but I have already bought several copies for friends and family members. I think this is a pretty guaranteed good time. Changing things up a little bit, I also read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte last fall when I was on a trip in North Carolina hiking amidst the fall foliage, which I have to say is a pretty great backdrop for reading a Bronte novel. This was my first Anne Bronte novel and I really enjoyed it. I can't say it has remained lodged in my soul in the same way that Charlotte Bronte's novels have, but I was surprised at what a page turner it was and how lively and energetic Anne Bronte's writing was. I think I was harboring an unfair assumption that Anne is the boring or moralizing Bronte sister. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is technically a temperance novel and Anne Bronte is certainly engaging with the social and political context of her world much more directly, I would say, than Charlotte or Emily do in their novels. So perhaps that timeliness is part of why Anne's novels have proved less enduring and less timeless than her sister's, but it also distinguishes her work within the rest of the Bronte oeuvre. She's like, in my novels, you're not gonna be haunted by the ghost of a former lover. You're gonna be haunted by 19th century English divorce laws. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is a frame narrative, the outer frame being narrated by a young gentleman farmer named Gilbert Markham, who becomes enamored with an enigmatic and antisocial widow named Helen Graham, the titular Tenant of Wildfell Hall, who moves into the neighborhood with her young son. And that outer narrative narrated by Gilbert is almost an Austin-esque romantic comedy of manners, which then gives way to the more harrowing story of how Helen came to be at Wildfell Hall. That comprises the inner narrative, which runs about 250 pages in the middle of the book and is made up of entries from Helen's diary that she gives Gilbert to read to kind of explain her circumstances. And that diary chronicles her disastrous marriage to an alcoholic and abusive man named Arthur Huntington and her attempts to escape that situation. So this book really has it all, mystery, suspense, some social commentary, a little bit of romance. I also have to mention that this Penguin Classics edition of the book has the most incredible notes at the end, written by Stevie Davies. Stevie was really cooking, as the kids say, with these end notes. They are a real treasure trove of insights, and they also introduced me to the concept of the Bronte scale of male emotion, which, as you can imagine, is more heightened than the average man's. Another classic that I read recently, the aforementioned Bucket list classic was The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoyevsky, which I think alternately could have been titled Intrusive Thoughts 1. What is this book about? Good question. It's about men, specifically fathers and sons, which normally I would say is not my business. It's about religion and philosophy. It's about inheritance in more ways than one. It's about Russia in the years after the freeing of the serfs. It's about 19th century Russian identity, especially as it relates to Western Europe. It's about a murder, supposedly. Fair warning that it'll take like 500 pages to get to that part. But there is a trial at the end to reward you for the trial of reading the book. I read this as part of a self-imposed book club with some friends. And I have to say, 
Like the brothers Karamazov themselves, we all suffered a great deal. In part because none of us knew a lot about Russian history or about Orthodox Christianity. And so I really cannot lie, I like hated this book for the first 540 pages of it. I found it incredibly long-winded and dense with religious and philosophical monologuing. There's a whole section with painfully few paragraph breaks called Father Zosima's Teachings, where I was like, please, let's just end it now. I think one of the reasons I struggled with it so much initially is that it really feels like a book that is speaking very specifically to the social and political issues of Dostoevsky's time. And so I spent the first two thirds of the book trying to find a foothold in the story and trying to identify what about it was resonant with or relevant to my own life and concerns as someone who admittedly does not spend that much time thinking about sin or ecclesiastical courts. So I do think this is the kind of novel that strongly benefits from reading it in a classroom setting, or if that ship has already sailed for you, from trying to supplement your already onerous reading experience with podcasts and articles that will help contextualize the book and kind of ground you more firmly in Dostoevsky's life and times. All that said, I will say Dostoevsky really turns things around in the last 200 pages or so of this book, namely because he remembers that there is a plot and storyline that he is trying to execute. I also think that while the first half of the book spends so much time plumbing the realms of the religious and the philosophical and the political, the back half of the book or the last third at least, brings that all down to earth a little bit and focuses in on the characters and relationships in a way that I found more emotionally resonant and compelling. And I will say that after spending more than 800 pages with these three brothers, I did feel a certain fondness and affection for all of them, particularly Alyosha, who is truly just too good for this cruel world. And you might even say that I felt surprisingly bereft when it was all over. It was a real triumph of the peak end rule in this case. Lastly, I want to mention The Sarantine Mosaic by my man Guy Gabriel Kay. This is a historical fantasy duology that is comprised of Sailing to Sarantium and Lord of Emperors. They're about 900 pages total and they really should be read as just one complete story, because if you read Sailing to Sarantium on its own, it's gonna feel really slow and anticlimactic. In case you forgot, I am on the record as a GGK stan. A Brightness Long Ago was my favorite book of 2021, and I have also read The Lions of al -Rasan. The Sarantine Mosaic is set in the same medieval universe as those two books, which more or less maps onto the real medieval world, except the names for everything are different and there is the slightest gloss of fantasy over all of it. The Sarantine Mosaic is set in what is essentially the Byzantine Empire during the reign of Justinian and Theodora. In these books, Byzantium is called Sarantium, and the story follows a master mosaicist named Crispin who is grieving the loss of his wife and daughters in his plague-ridden hometown in Italy when he is summoned by the emperor to travel to Sarantium to design and decorate the dome of the great sanctuary that the emperor is building there. Then, as is the case for many a GGK hero, Crispin finds himself caught up in the affairs of the great men and women of his time, from the emperor and the empress to the city's most celebrated and sought after dancers and chariot racers, to an alchemist whose connection with the half world suffuses this series with a subtle kind of magic. One of my favorite things about Guy Gabriel Kay's books is the way that he world builds, and particularly the way that he builds a deep sense of religion and culture and history within his books. Religion features prominently in many a Guy Gabriel Kay book, but even more so here. And I love the way that these books specifically look at 
the Eastern and Western branches of the Jadite religion, which is his version of Christianity. I love how he looks at how religion functions politically, how it serves as an engine for art and culture, how the Jadite god is rendered artistically in the West versus in the East. There's this incredible scene where Crispin, as he is making his way to Serantium, stops at a roadside chapel and sees for the first time a mosaic dome that interprets the Jadite god in the Eastern style and the Eastern tradition. And he is literally brought to his knees by the beauty and force of that image. Related to both religion and art is also this series interest in legacies, the legacies of empires and emperors, the legacies of artists and charioteers and individuals. And this is really where Guy Gavriel Kay excels at capturing contrasting senses of scale in all things. So he'll do this thing where he is able to capture a grand heroic sense of scale while also within that scene setting reminding you of the relative smallness of individual men and women's lives. And he'll do that sometimes by narrowing in on a specific character and telling you in a few brief sentences what they will accomplish in their lifetime and what their life and legacy will amount to. He'll also include things like a brief cutaway scene where you see uh, a man being sent into the desert miles and miles from Serantium. And in that brief moment, you'll glimpse and be reminded of the inevitable rise and falls of cities and religions and civilizations, of the ultimate smallness, not only of individual men's ambitions, but also sometimes of the ambitions of an entire empire. Anyway, I loved this series. A Brightness Long Ago will always be my favorite Guy Gabriel K book, but these two books together are a close second and I can't wait to read more of his stuff. That's all I have for now. Let me know if you, like me, still exist and what you've been reading for the last 15 or 16 months. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. And I promise that will be sooner rather than later. Bye!